Yeah, the webinar will just be starting in about five minutes. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this week's uh, A12 Lions Learning uh, webinar. Uh, we've been doing one of these uh, every week since the uh, beginning of April, so um, 
I don't know how many that is, but we're probably up to 12 or 15 by now. And tonight's going to be a good one. Tonight we have past district governor Dave Durant. He's the district A12 historian and uh, also works with Ray Charbonneau, who is the mobile district A historian and uh, works with him on the uh, Lions Centennial celebration works with him on all sorts of things such as the uh, the Lions 100 that we just recently celebrated for uh, uh, our worldwide association. So so he's a wealth of knowledge and uh, uh, you know he'll be pulling out I'm confident some uh, funny and interesting facts about uh, uh, about Lions and. Uh, and the history of, of District A12 and a history of Lions in Canada. So it should be a, a great, great webinar. Um, before we start, though, we should uh, go through a couple of the interfaces that, that you, for those of you who may not have attended a go-to webinar in the past. So over to uh, probably the right side of your screen is a is a go to webinar control panel. If you don't see it, there's a little orange arrow that if you click that, it should pop out. And if you click it, click it again, it'll disappear. If you want to keep it visible on front all the time, click the view button. And then where it says auto hide the control panel, uh, uncheck that and then you'll be able to see it and it'll stay on top of your screen all the time. Below that is a question pane, and you're welcome to ask questions throughout the webinar, and uh, uh, unless Dave is talking too much, then I might be able to interrupt him every now and then and uh, chime in one of those questions, or uh, we can hold it and, and, and put it in at a, at a particular time or a little break in the action. Uh, so you just have to type the question in, and I might be able to answer it behind the scenes while Dave's doing his thing. Um, and the next slide, Dave. Um, I should have also mentioned about your audio. Uh, just above that question pane is your audio uh, selection pane. And here's where you select whether you're connecting by your headset or, or your phone or your um, uh, your computer uh, speakers and microphone. So you can just, just select that and change that, especially if you want to raise your hand later on, which we'll see on the next screen. You can just click uh, raise your hand and uh, at that point, I can unmute you and you can ask your question if you have a microphone attached to to your system. Uh, it should be a great webinar, lots of interactivity and, and lots, lots of great, cool information from uh, Past District Governor Dave. So over to you, Dave. Thank you, Chris. Good evening and welcome all. Thank you for taking the time to join us. This is what we're going to be covering tonight. We're going to look at the start of Lionism in the USA and Canada, a formation of uh, multiple District A, the formation of District A12, and then a look at the A12 Lions, Lioness and Leo Clubs, and then a few little history tidbits from A12 that I wanted to share with you. We're going uh, through the magic of your imagination to be traveling back through time tonight and to travel back in time, we need a time machine. So I have selected the DeLorean time car. And some of you may be old enough to remember this from the movie Back to the Future from a few years ago. Don't be concerned, my computer will do the driving and we've had several test runs and we haven't been too lost. So just relax, enjoy our travels. And we'll start by taking our time machine back to 1911. Yes, that wasn't a misspeak. We're going to start in 1911. At that time, Dr. William P. Woods of Evansville, Indiana, founded the Royal Order of Lions. He was a surgeon and it was a fraternal organization and a secret society. And he founded it on August the 8th, 1911. However, after a few years, the organization would be disbanded in favor of a more service-oriented uh, organization. So Dr. Woods began forming Lions Clubs as early as 1915 to provide a service organization. In October 1916, 
he officially incorporated the successor organization to the Royal Order of Lions as the International Association of Lions Clubs. Eh, personally, I kind of like the, uh, the Royal Order of Lions, but I'm 100 years too late. So here we are in Chicago, 1917, and that's where you thought we would be starting. You always thought Melvin started the organization. Well, he was a key player, and he is certainly responsible for getting our organization where it is today. As you are well aware, Melvin had his own insurance brokerage and he was secretary of a men's club called the Business Circle of Chicago that he'd been a member of for four or five years. Like Dr. Woods, Melvin felt that some of the groups of businessmen could do a lot more than just network. So he invited several other groups to come to a meeting to discuss the formation of a national group, which could not only network, but could also give back to their communities. Several groups were invited, including the Optimus Club of Chicago, the Vortex Men's Club of Detroit and St. Louis, and several other groups, one of which was the International Association of Lions Clubs that I mentioned on the earlier slide. At that time, the International Association of Lions Clubs had about 35 clubs in various states. So Melvin and Dr. Woods during that meter became the key players. There was some reluctance with some of the groups to give up their name. Everybody wanted the new group to be called Vortex or be called Business Circle. But Dr. Woods invited the other group to join his association. And with Melvin's urging, most of the other groups did join. The International Association of Lions Clubs had a constitution and the dues were only a dollar a year payable semi-annually. The optimists decided not to join and as you know, there are still optimist clubs out there. The business circle joined the Lions Group Club organization in August of 1917, so at that time, Melvin became a lion. The first convention was held a few months later in Dallas, Texas, where Dr. Woods was elected president and Melvin Jones elected as secretary. The emblem was adopted. The code of ethics and objects, now known as purposes, were adopted. And it should be noted that there was a motion to change the name from the International Association of Lions Clubs to the Vortex Men's Club, but it was voted down, thank goodness. At that time, business women were allowed to join, but membership was limited to white persons only. The next convention was in St. Louis, Missouri, and there were several changes made it was revised to only allow white males to belong to the association. The term white, of course, was removed a few years later, but it took until 1987 to allow women to join. Another interesting fact is the early constitution also had a requirement that only communities with a population of 5,000 citizens or more would be allowed to have a Lions Club. Let's move our time machine a little bit forward to Canada in 1920. There was a Lions Club in Detroit. It had been founded in January of 1920. And these Detroit Lions were instrumental in starting a club on the other side of the river in Windsor, Ontario. And they did so in March, 1920. It was called the Border Cities Lions Club, which is not surprising since the whole area around Windsor at that time was called border cities. Even the newspaper. It's interesting if you're doing a quick scan at this newspaper from July 26, 1920, 
that there is an article there about the Lions Club back waterways at the Denver meeting. So in July 1920, one of the Lions from this brand new club chartered in March went to Denver, Colorado and attended the International Convention. The Border City Star, of course, is now called the Windsor Star. In addition to the club in Windsor, clubs were also formed in Toronto and in Hamilton in 1920. These were the first clubs outside of the USA, so Canada made the International Association of Lions Clubs truly international. 1921 saw some more clubs formed in Ontario in Chatham, Oshawa, Belleville, Wallaceburg, and London, and also in BC. Spence's Bridge, which is a little town up by Kamloops, and in Vancouver. Winnipeg was also formed in 1921. In 1922, clubs were formed in Montreal and Quebec City, as well as several additional clubs in Ontario during that year. The growth of lionism continued. In 1927, clubs were formed in Swift Current and Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. In 1929, clubs were formed in Calgary and Edmonton, and in 1930, the clubs started to form in the Maritimes. The first club in New Brunswick was in a little town called McAdam, a small town in the southwest part of the province. I would have lost that bet because I would have bet that it would have been Fredericton or St. John or Moncton be the first town in New Brunswick with a Lions Club, but apparently not. 1945 had a club form in Halifax, which was the first club in Nova Scotia. In 1948, we moved out to the Rock with the first club in Corner Brook, Newfoundland. And in 1949, we came back to PEI to a little town called Montague, Prince Edward Island. Then we go way out to the other side of the country. And in 1958, we had the first club formed in Whitehorse. Finally, the clubs moved into the northern areas of Canada with clubs in Labrador City and Inuvik Northwest Territories in 1961. As you can see, Lionism was in every province in Canada by 1949 and in the territories by 1961. Since we're looking at a map of Canada, I want us to jump into our time machine and come to, to 2020 and have a look at Canada as it is today with Lions Clubs and multiple districts. Multiple District Day, you can see, is here in Ontario. Multiple District U is Quebec, St. Pierre, and Miquelon. Multiple District N is New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland, Labrador, and a few clubs in Maine. MD5M is Manitoba, Minnesota, and Northwestern Ontario. MD5 is Saskatchewan and North and South Dakota. MDC is Alberta, part of BC and the Northwest Territories. Multiple District 19 is British Columbia, Washington and Idaho. And Multiple District 49 is the Yukon, some Northern BC clubs and Alaska. So we can see how we have expanded and right across from border to border, coast to coast. Some of the multiple districts are strictly Canadian. Some of the multiple districts have are tied in 
with districts in the states. Now, let's start, look at this multiple district A in a little more detail and see how it was formed. As you recall from before, we had three clubs in Ontario in 1920. During the next seven years, there were several more clubs formed, with the majority of them in southern Ontario, but there were the two in Quebec that we talked about, and Sudbury, North Bay, and Ottawa all had clubs. Multiple A, multiple district A was not in effect then, so these clubs were part of multiple district 10 in the USA. Michigan and part of Wisconsin and Ontario and Quebec. Expansion in lionism in Ontario and Quebec continued to take place during the following years. Although the districts in the states were all numbers, for some reason, LCI felt the Canadian districts should be letters and we were given District A. So Ontario and Quebec were District A. One year, actually, we were A and B. With District A, were all the clubs east of Hamilton in Ontario and Quebec, and District B were all the clubs west of Hamilton, basically southwestern Ontario. The A and B designation did not last long. I understand the reason it was uh, created was apparently disagreement between some of the senior people at that time on district operation procedures. The disagreement were resolved and all the clubs were then once again called part of District A. By 1938, we had 69 clubs in Ontario and Quebec, certainly enough for a multiple district. So multiple district A was created and three districts, A1, A2, A3, and of course, we were no longer tied into Michigan. Now I should point out that the 1938 convention was held at our own very own Big Win Inn on Lake of Bays. And at that time, as I mentioned, we were no longer part of the District 10, multiple District 10. Thunder Bay is both physically and financially closer to Winnipeg than Toronto. So the Northwest part of Ontario was not included in the rest of Ontario and Quebec as part of the newly formed multiple district A. Lionism was growing like crazy. And when I talk about the formation of Lions Clubs in Ontario and Quebec, I have to mention one lion in particular. For over 30 years, the huge growth of lionism in Ontario and Quebec was in a large part due to the efforts of this one man. His name was Lion Bruce Malcolm. Bruce was hired by Lions Clubs International in 1937-38 Lions year to organize Lions Clubs in Ontario and Quebec, and he sure did. The photograph shows Bruce on the left. Next to Bruce is Stan Darling. Now, not our Stan Darling from Berks Falls. This particular Stan Darling was a district governor in A3 in 1948-49. And Walter Fisher, who of course were international presidents. And the chap on the right, you may recognize, it's our own Melvin Jones. Bruce Malcolm passed away in 1971. And I was going through some old newspapers and I found an obituary for Bruce in the November 1971 Huntsville Forester newspaper. And this obituary says it all. Part of it reads, Bruce Malcolm will be remembered as one of the outstanding lions in Ontario. He was responsible for the organization for nearly every club 
in Muskoka and Parry Sound area, as well as a great many others throughout Ontario and Quebec, and even Great Britain." Unquote. For a guy who lived in Niagara Falls, to have his obituary published in the Huntsville newspaper obviously shows that he did achieve greatness. So a lot of the growth we're going to look at at MDA in the next few years is due to the efforts of Bruce Malcolm. So as I mentioned in 1938, MDA was formed into districts A1, A2 and A3. In 1939, there were 85 clubs in MDA, so District A4 was added. District A4 is the area around Ottawa and at that time Quebec. In spite of the war in Europe, in 1941 District A5 was created and as you are probably aware that is the northern part of Ontario and Quebec. At this time there were about 100 clubs in MDA. There was a war on in Europe so not a lot took place with the expansion until the war was over. By the early 50s, the number of clubs in MDA had doubled to over 200, so districts A6, A7 and A8 were added. A6, of course, was northern Ontario. A7 was around Toronto and A8 was in Quebec. A9 was created in 1958 because we had over 300 clubs in Ontario and Quebec and because of the growth of lionism in the next few years even more districts were added. A10 in Quebec was added in 1964 as well as district A11. A11 was around the Hamilton area. I need a drum roll please because in 1972, the best district in all of Lionism was created, of course, our own District A12. At the same year, on the same year, uh, District A14 was created in Quebec. And if you are looking and counting, you will realize there was no District A13. Uh, apparently, lions are a superstitious lot. Lionism continued to grow and in 1976 we had the formation of districts A15 and 16 in Ontario. A15 is around the Kitchener area, A16 is in the Markham, Newmarket, Oshawa area. In 1982 the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon were added to MDA. Although they are, belong to France, they are just off the coast of Newfoundland. In 1989, our last district, District A17, was formed and it was in Quebec. I know, I know, you've heard it, I've heard it. There's no politics in Lionism. Well, that may be not always true. You will recall that in the mid 90s, there was a lot of talk about separation of the province of Quebec. And the Lions of Quebec were no different and they wanted to separate from us as well. So in 1994, they did separate. No, not from Canada, but the Lions of Quebec separated from MDA and created multiple district U. Districts A8, A10, A14 and A17 all left. And you can see the drop of the number of clubs on the chart. MDA was much smaller in size because we no longer had Quebec. MDA then had excuse me, 12 districts as shown on the table. However, there are more changes to happen. In 1999, A6 was merged with both A5 and 
25 clubs moved to A5 and 10 clubs moved to MDU in Quebec. And in 2002, districts A7 and A11 merged. We had uh, 42 clubs in A7 and 39 clubs in District 11, and they formed District A711. As you will note from the graph, at that point, MDA was made up of just over 500 clubs in 10 districts. It'll also hopefully show you why multiple district day with 10 districts has a weird numbering system because they go from A1 to A16. So where are these districts that I've been talking about? Well, A1 is Windsor, London, that area. A2 is Niagara Falls, St. Catharines, the North Shore of Lake Erie. A3 is the North Shore of Lake Ontario up to Algonquin Park. Cities like Kingston and Peterborough are included there. A4 is Ottawa, Cornwall, and I think about 11 clubs in Quebec are part of A4. A5 is Northern Ontario from Powassan to James Bay, much, much larger than is shown on this map. We will look at it a little bit later. A711 was the resulting uh, district when the A7 and people and the A11 people join. And that of course is the Toronto Hamilton area. A9 is Bruce Peninsula, shores of Lake Huron and Georgian Bray. Another drum roll for the best district, A12. A15 came in after we did. And as I mentioned, they were around the Kitchener area. And A16 are Minden to Oshawa. So that was the creation of our current multiple district A. Chris, if anybody has any questions or observations, it's probably a good time for them to uh, speak up. Sure, you can either uh, raise your hand or uh, type something to the question pane or even the chat box and I'll I'll work it out. Um, I did answer a question from Darlene. Uh, earlier on, you had the um, uh, the original Lions logo, and she she asked if that was a letter opener or a knife, and I said it was a club because that's a visual pun on Lions Club. And Tom Gordon's looking for a copy of your uh, uh, map of all the multiples as well. So I told him I'd make sure we get that to you to him after the uh, the presentation. So okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Oh uh, oh Diane just asked where does Nunafoot fit? Uh yeah. So we've been working on a club off and on the last couple of years up in Nunavut. Um I have no idea which multiple it would be part of. It might be part of uh multiple district U. Um uh, originally, it was going to be multiple District A because the only flights to Nunavut came out of Ottawa, but now they have daily flights from Montreal, so it might make more sense in uh, in Quebec. So. Good. And uh, Jamie has a question. His, his club was chartered in 1937. Um, Bradford, would that have been part of A3 at the time? Yes. 1937, he would have been part of A which would be part of the multiple oh, district right. 10. They're, they're a bunch of Americans, apparently. Right. So can we carry on then? We'll talk about the formation of yep. the best district. And there will be other time in the end for some more questions. 1970 was a very special year. It was the 50th anniversary of Lionism in Canada. There was a big MDA convention held in 1970, and you have to guess where it was held. Ah, yeah, I've heard several of you say 
obviously it would be held in Windsor. The, it's where Canada has had lionism starting in Canada 50 years prior. So let's get into our time machine and whip back to Windsor in 1970. Ah, we're in the middle of the parade. Huge parade, parade, almost three hours long, I understand. And because it was our 50th anniversary of lionism in Canada, there was a huge turnout. And that's the one question I forgot to ask Ray, how many were registered for it, <coughs> but maybe he'll be able to tell us that information a bit later. I know in the year before in Ottawa, there were over 10,000 registered for the MDA convention there. One of the reasons for the large MDA attendance was the fact that until 1979-80, the district governor was elected at the MDA convention. So there was always a big turnout of Lions to go and vote for their district governor. Now, of course, we elect our district governors at the district conventions. The photo shows Bob Hannigan, the Huntsville Lions on the left hold of the banner, Lion George Green beside him. I'm not sure who this lion is. And the next one over is Kent Ng. And I should mention that Kent is still a member of the Gravenhurst Lions Club. On the right is Henry Butler of Port Carling. And driving the convertible behind was Phil Kepler of the Bracebridge Lions Club. As you will note from the banner, these clubs are part of our District A12, Region 21. But at that point in time, A12 had not been formed. So these clubs, these nine clubs of Region 21 were part of A5. Two years later, when our district was created, these nine clubs were moved from District A5 into the new District A12. And they created the northern part of our district. The whole district was made up of 52 clubs, which were taken from A3, A5, as I mentioned, A7, which is down in the Toronto area, remember, and from A9, which is the Bruce Peninsula area. A total of 53 clubs transferred in to create District A12. As you can see from the map, District A12 was huge. It went all the way from Brit down to Highway 7, almost over to Oshawa. It was a huge, huge district. There were four regions, eight zones in this new district. The numbers in the brackets were the size of the clubs that I was able to determine. And you can see some of the clubs are pretty large. The largest one was Barry at 76 members, Allison had 68, Port Carling had 63, and Bradford 60. During that year, Lionism was still expanding and new clubs were formed in Innisfil, Oral, Stevenson, and Victoria Harbor. During the next three years, we increased from 53 to, to 62 clubs. In 1975, because of this rapid growth of Lionism, districts A15 and 16 were formed. So 22 clubs were transferred out of A12 to help create District A16. The two regions and the clubs shown here in red were the ones that left our pretty new three-year-old district, A12. The 40 clubs that were left were redistrict, 
were redistributed to the three regions that we currently have, Region 8, 21, and 36. One thing it did do was make our district quite a bit smaller. Oh, back up there. The solid line is the shape of our current district. The dotted line is the shape of the district before A16 was formed. From before, you recall that in 1999, districts A5 and 6 were merged together. A6 was the northern part of a5 and they merged together and some of the clubs went to MDU, some of the clubs went into A5. And as I mentioned before, the A5 area of, of the multiple district A is very huge. And uh, it stretched from Algonquin Park in the south to James Bay in the north. And the travel requirements for the officers travel requirements to have a cabinet meeting were pretty, uh, they were huge, just uh, it was a big bay and it still is a big bay area. But in order to help them out, and also it didn't hurt our uh, membership at all, we had seven clubs transferred to A12 in uh, 2002. And this is the sequence of events that gives us our current district A12. Redistricting is always a touchy issue. Clubs do not like to be moved from one district to another, but sometimes it is necessary. There are no plans that I'm aware of at the present time to change any of the district boundaries. However, Lions Clubs International say we should have 1,250 Alliance in each district. So someday, possibly in the future, we may see more redistricting in MDA with one district removed and split up into other districts. We'll have to make sure we get our membership up to 1,250 members and keep it there. And then we'll have a much better chance of continuing A12 as we know it. Now we're going to have a look at the clubs in District A12 and see when they were formed. We're going to hop back about 90 years, so I need our uh, time car again, and we'll go back to 1931. The first club formed that is now in A12 was Yes, I heard two of you say it, Barry, in September of 1931. And as you will note from the slide, Barry was the 34th club formed in District A. As you may recall from a previous slide, MDA was not even formed until 1938. So when Barry chartered, it was part of the multiple District 10 in the USA. I found this ad in a Barry newspaper called the Northern Advance, and it was for December 24th, 1932. And it was to see a movie called Let's Go Native. And you'll notice the admission price was 35 cents. Not much by today's standards, but remember this was 1931. The Great Depression was on. And as you will see on the next slide, 35 cents was a lot of money. Times were tough in the early 30s. Unemployment reached 27% in Ontario in 1933. The government created relief camps to provide work and the pay was 20 cents a day for construction work on roads, railroads, national and provincial parks. After Barry was formed in 1931, it was obviously a couple of years until the next club was formed 
because of the after effects of the depression. Allison was formed in 1936, Aurelia Bradford in Midland in 37, Berks Falls in 38, and you can see the list. I'll leave it there so you can sort of go through it. I won't read it out to you. You can just go through it, pick out your own club and see how it turned out or where it was on the pecking order of the year of charter of our clubs. So these are the 47 clubs we currently have in A12. And yes, there are some missing. That's because several clubs in A12 have surrendered their charter. This chart shows the year that the clubs surrendered their charter, the name of the club, and the number of years that they had been in existence. Rosso was the first club after A12 was formed to surrender their charter in 1978. Rosso was sponsored by Perry Sound, but only lasted for five years. Beaton was sponsored by Bonhead, and Beaton also had a second club open in 1999, but it also closed in 2014. Honey Harbor had a club for almost 20 years, and of course now we have the Baxter Ward Club in that area. ET closed in 1997. And the reason they close is that no one could pronounce or spell their name correctly. Collingwood had been in operation for 49 years. They had their own hall, but they closed in 2005. We had another club, the Collingwood Mountain Club, started in 2006, but died out a year later. But we now have a new club in Collingwood, started 2017, which was sponsored by Wasaga Beach. Creemore closed in 2008. Cookstown, sponsored by Bradford. Again, Cookstown had their own hall, and they had been operating for 36 years, but surrendered their charter in 2008. Oral Medante, Pointer Barrel, Bella, Tiny Trails. Barry Sunrise was a breakfast club. Beaton, Wabashine, and Guilford were the last club to surrender as charter. I'm sorry to say these 18 clubs are closed. We could certainly do with them. The people they served could certainly do with them. Let's take a quick look at Lioness and Leo Clubs. Lioness Clubs were approved by Lions International in 1975. Prior to that, they were a group of ladies and they were called Lionettes. In the district minutes from August 1977, A12 cabinet meeting, I found that Lion Gord and Lionette Evelyn Walker were appointed to become the Lioness Club's representative to look into the forming of Lioness Clubs in A12. And when you look at there, the clubs formed the years 1977, 78, there were a lot of clubs formed. They did a great job. As you can see from the table, we've had Lioness Clubs in 21 communities and six of them are still active. Leos have been around a lot longer. They were approved by Lions International in 1957. And as you can see, we've had a lot of Leo clubs. We've had uh, 19 communities that have had Leo clubs and we still have five that are still active. Actually, I was doing some research today and I found that uh, Perry Sound started a Leo Club in 1971. So I have to add that to my list.
Now, the beginning, I told you I was going to share some A12 tidbits with you. The first thing I hear stories about how many times the convention's been in such and such a place. So I, I did a little summary. Our first convention for A12 was held in Midland in 1975. And that's their pin on the upper left-hand corner. The Midland, Penetang, Victoria Harbor Lions were the sponsors. Since then, we've had 45 district conventions and they've been held in various locations around the district. And the table knows the number of times the district convention has been held in the various venues around A12. There have been several occasions where we've had vice presidents of Lions Clubs International or past presidents of Lions Clubs International visit our district. But I can only find two cases where a sitting president of LCI has visited A12. Remember the sitting president only has 365 days during his or her term of office. And with all the meetings, the running of our organization, special charter nights, conventions, etc., it is indeed a special occasion to have a sitting president visit a district. I remember a few years ago, Nancy and I talking to incoming LCI President Ty Sup Lee. And at that point in May, was just before he took office, he said he was booked for over 270 events during his upcoming year. He didn't think he would be home in Korea for more than 10 or 12 days during the whole year that he was president of Lions International. So visits from sitting presidents occurred twice in our district. Once was in 2007 in Midland when sitting president Jimmy Ross visited the charter night of the Tiny Trails Lions Club. The other one, and I don't expect you to read this whole article, it is available in our A12 history book. I, I know, Chris, that was a pretty cheap plug, wasn't it? But th this article was in 1945 when the then sitting president of Lions Clubs International visited the Bracebridge Lions Club. As you will recall from a few minutes ago, Bracebridge only chartered in 1942. So a visiting from a sitting president of LCI must have been a very special occasion. The LCI president at that time was Dr. Romaro Colosio from Havana, Cuba. I must confess, I found the article, until I found the article, I didn't even realize there were lions in Cuba, but apparently there were clubs in Cuba until the revolution in 1958 when Castro banned them. President Colosio stopped for lunch with the Bracebridge Lions while on his way from Toronto to North Bay. Another thing unique about A12 are the camps that we have. I'd like to read something to you from the 1967 issue of Lion Age. At the Tuesday morning session, the late Joseph Holiday Fund went over the top. Club after club came forward to make further contributions until with only $1,036 to go to reach the $350,000 commitment, past international president Lion Harry Newman stood up and announced that he would make up the deficit. The thunderous applause that followed the completion of the project was not only for Harry's most generous gesture, but also for the Lions of Ontario, who worked so hard for six years to make the Lake Joseph project a success. I should also point out that the Night of Lake Joe fundraiser was started by an A12 lion, Lionel Newton of the Oral Lions Club. As I mentioned, we have lots of camps. In 1974, A12 led in the construction of the Bob Rumble Camp for the Deaf. 
the Perry Sound Lions were very instrumental in the construction and the development of that camp. Camp Dorset started construction in 1978 after four years of planning and fundraising. Of course, when we think of Camp Dorset, we think of Sandy Ailes of A12. And of course, we also have Camp Huronda and Camp Ooch in our district. And Camp Ooch is District Governor James' project for this year. As you know, most district governors in A12 have had a, a project that they raise funds for. As I mentioned, Governor Jamie's raising funds for Camp Ooch. In 1982-83, the district governor's project was to have the lions of the district sell boxes of soap. The plan was to raise $60,000 to be divided between the three lions camps that we supported, CNIB, Camp of the Deaf, and Dorset. It was not what you would call a huge success. In 1988, six years after the start, the remaining 80 cases of soap were donated to the camps. I'm sure District Governor Jamie's glad he didn't try to raise funds by selling soap that year. Those of us who were a little bit longer in the tooth and served as district officers in the 80s and early 90s used to get so much soap as a gift on our official visit. Training for incoming officers used to be done at the district conventions on Sunday morning for an hour. I can assure you it was not too successful. Imagine being an incoming president treasurer or secretary for the club and having your training presented in an hour-long session when both you and the presenter are probably hungover from the convention hospitality rooms the night before. We then started to do longer training, a half day or more, usually renting a school. The problem is that adults do not fit very well on kindergarten chairs or at kids' desks. So we started the LLW, the Lions Learning Weekend, in 2002. We selected the Kemperfeld Center in Barrie, where we had comfortable adult-sized classrooms and tremendous food, a real change from previous training. Since then, the LLW has moved around the district, and we've been told the LLW is one of the best when it comes to district training. But what else would you expect from the best district? I have to mention this last item or he'll be cutting my slides off. Another bit of recent history from A12. Our own past history governor, Chris Lewis, started the A12 day of service in 2014 when he was governor. This idea has not only continued, but has spread to other districts all over Canada and some in the States. Another idea that makes A12 the best. Well, this has been quite a journey through our time in our DeLorean time travel car. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Dave. Uh, Ray Charbonneau had a comment. I'll see if I can unmute him. Uh, back here. Ray, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? You sure bet. Can. Yeah, great. And Dave, uh, congratulations. Wonderful presentation. You really did your research and then well done. Thank you. Um, I was going to go back to uh, the comment about multiple District 10 and that early history because uh, uh, you might, uh, most of it is act quite accurate, but uh, there's one, one little step sort of missing in the middle. Um, the first clubs uh, up until Belleville, I think, which was ch chartered in October of 1920, were included with clubs that were in uh, Michigan at the time and Wisconsin, believe it or not. But that district at that time was called District 9 because oh. uh, prior to 1921, all the districts in the United States were numbered differently than they are now. 
they were numbered number one in California, for instance, and uh, they ended up at number nine in uh, in uh, Michigan. Um, even I, th I don't think uh, Texas was even uh, District Two back then. But anyway, in 1921, they redevised the system that we have now, and all the numbers that we know for multiple districts in uh, in the United States are that way. Um, in October of 1920, we had. Uh, Harry Newman, who was the second international vice president at the time, brought the executive committee to Toronto. It was the first time that they'd all visited there. And they were there for somewhat selfish purposes because they were there to make a presentation to Toronto of their charter at that time. But they took the opportunity to have a meeting and that's where they created District A. Um, and as you rightly said, that was to, uh, it was designed so that to differentiate from the American clubs, all these clubs outside of the United States would be given letter designations. And I heard you mention Cuba, they were the original District C, for instance. Uh, District B was Mexico and uh, so on. But uh, the other thing they had to do was they had to come up with a governor. So the original governor for those first five clubs, I guess, was the district governor out of Michigan, who was a guy named Judge Garner. So he's kind of officially our first governor, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, but then in Toronto on October of 1920, they appointed a governor at that time. His name was Fred Ketchison. And as they were in Toronto, I just think they picked a local boy. And it wasn't until February of 21 that we actually had an election because we had our first convention in Toronto. And it was Louis Livingston of Windsor who became our first elected uh, district governor. And we remain District A from 1920 to 1938, where your story picks up quite accurately. We became multiple District A, and you had all the number sequences exactly right. I, you know, I, it's, it's not a big deal, but I just thought I'd kind of clarify that. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Are That's there right. any other quests? Uh, let's see if you have any questions for Dave, and we can always chime in, Ray, if if uh, gets to be really hard, right, Dave? You betcha. Um, so uh, you can just type your questions in the question pane, or if you'd like to raise your hand. Uh, Ruth has a has a comment. She said it was a, a great presentation, well laid out, and and very helpful. She really thanked you. So, are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any more questions right now. Let me just check the chat panel. Nothing in the chat. And All right. Nobody's got their hand raised. Well, here we are at the drive-in. I do hope you've enjoyed your travel through time. There's a lot of additional information I could have added. Heck, I had over 100 years to select from LCI and 48 years of District A12 info to pick from. But uh, the hour is up. Thank you, Chris, for your assistance. Thank you, Ray, for your input previously and, and your comments tonight. And thank you to the rest of you for your attention and your participation tonight. Enjoy your centennial. It's not exactly what we expected, but it is our centennial. Stay safe, stay healthy. Good night and over to you, Chris. Hey, thanks so much, Dave. Uh, uh, you know, I just really want to uh, commend you for uh, for showing a little bit of A12 pride as well, because you know our little district in Central Ontario, I think, has done some pretty amazing things over our uh, you know 45 years. Yep, for no for you know, 40 almost, almost 50 years, 48 yep. years now, almost 50, right? Yep. So. Um, you know, like we have, we've accomplished lots of great things and I think we've made a bit of an impact on Mobile District Day and hopefully around the world, which is pretty fantastic. So we have another webinar coming up uh, next week on May 28th and uh, it's all about engaging youth through LEOs. So uh, Monica Millicopkins uh, is a LEO club advisor for the brand new Georgian Bay LEO clubs and, and she's gonna be talking a little bit about how to engage young people and, and using the LEO program to, to really make, make an impact in their lives. So we'd encourage you to, to register for that. The links are available either on uh, our district website, a12lions.org, or you can just go to our District A12 Facebook page. Uh, we're also in the, uh, the midst of uh, finalizing some dates for 
presidents and secretaries training to occur in the month of June and into July uh, because we still have all the stuff that has to happen from uh, the Lions Learning Weekend, which uh, unfortunately didn't happen. So I really want to thank you all for, for coming and we hope to see you uh, next week at the uh, LEO webinar and uh, hope you all just uh, take care and stay safe. Good night.